Okay, so thank you for coming today. Um, today we're going to be talking about maintaining your brain, highlighting foods, lifestyle habits, and when to worry. And with me today, I have Eileen Poily, and she's from the um, director. She's a director of education at the USF Health Bird Alzheimer's Institute. So I feel really glad to have her here with our expertise. And so um, I can get the slide to move ahead. We will <laughs> go ahead. So um, as you can see, that's me on the left. I'm a registered dietitian. I work with um, as a family and consumer sciences agent in the University of Florida in the extension. And then Eileen is pictured to the, the right. And when she talks, she might um, introduce herself more, but I'm um, just really glad to have her today. So thank you. And then if you haven't used Zoom lately, um, just I'm gonna, I put up the chat box. So if you have any questions or comments, just type them in there and we'll try to get to them at the end, if not before. And so you can kind of either hover over the top or the bottom of the screen and the, the tools should show up. And then there's an option for a chat. Um, and that that's where you could write questions or anything like that. So we'd love to have any questions you have. So this is my part then. I'm just gonna be talking about eating for brain health, the eating part, nutrition, chronic disease. That's my specialty part. And so then um, Eileen's gonna talk to you more about different um, Alzheimer's things So, and dementia. And I also have a please, like a short evaluation following this and I'll try to send that out to you, but it can really help figure out, you know, how I can make things better. So I would love if you would do that. Thank you. So, um, Eating for mind health, right, is um, one of the things like I've turned to then is the mind diet. And so this was developed by a lady named Martha Morris. And she, long time ago, just realized that there was a connection between nutrition and the brain and um, keeping it healthy. And so I'm going to talk to you about kind of what she found and all the other researches research that she has found and led and just um, other people then too that have developed kind of these foods that we know can really help our brain. So we'll just talk about what it is, research findings, and then what to eat, the most fun part, and how you can make it work for you. So just um, brief overview, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. So an estimated 5.1 million people in the US have Alzheimer's. Um, and so a number that's expected to grow by 2025. And so more than two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. What causes it? So it looks like there's a growing awareness that lifestyle factors, not just genetics, play a prominent role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. So past studies have yielded evidence that suggests that what we eat may play a significant role in determining who gets Alzheimer's disease and who doesn't. So like food can really matter, which is kind of cool. And so kind of hoping to come up with the optimal diet that will lessen the chances of developing the disease. So um, where does it come from then? So um, they developed like um, the mind diet. So these are like foods that they basically found were the ones that most helpful to your brain. And so they kind of um, looked at all these different studies and things and then picked them out. And they looked um, primarily at the Mediterranean diet and then the DASH diet, um, which is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And so both of those diets, they know are good for your heart. And they've also found to be um, looking like they were promising to help the brain also. So they started with those and then they looked at other research to figure out which like foods especially can help the brain. So it's kind of a combination of two really great uh, ways of eating. And I wanna to specify too, you know, it's not like a diet, it's just um, kind of showing you just some foods that are something you can incorporate into the way of your life. And that would really help your brain, so. Okay, so here's some of the research like that really helped um, solidify that it could work. So the study compared the MIND diet with that Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. So there was 923 participants aged 58 to 98 years and participants diets were scored by giving points if they ate um, brain healthy foods frequently and avoided the unhealthy ones. So it's like they were checking these people and what they were eating and during the follow up period then four and a half years, 144 of those people developed Alzheimer's disease. So they kind of tracked them on what they're eating. So they know all three of these diets are pretty good for the brain or the two, but they were comparing the mind diet to see, you know, like, could this one help too? So it was kind of cool. All three diets, when people followed them pretty closely, they offered significant protection against Alzheimer's. So the Mediterranean diet lowered Alzheimer's risk by 54%, the mind diet by 53%, and the DASH diet by 
39%. So all these are plant-based diets. So they have a lot of like fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and beans and um, yeah, things like that, I guess, where it's less of the animal products like meats, it's just lower and, you know, not so much added sugars or things like that. So they're all kind of around the same types of foods, but in different proportions. So what makes the mind diet different? Because if I looked at the other slide, I would say I'd probably pick the Mediterranean diet, right? Because it has the least um, chances of getting Alzheimer's disease. But what makes the mind diet different is that, you know, if you don't com like moderate compliance to either the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet, there's only like um, some small benefits. But with the mind diet, so like with these foods that we're gonna talk about then, even adhering to the diet moderately, like on or off, um, compliance showed results. So it's like, even if you could just pick one or two foods from what I'm going to talk about that can really help you then. And so following it moderately, um, well, we're 35% less likely to develop the disease than those with the lowest adherence. So it's like, you know, even just doing some of the stuff can help counter the disease. So that kind of makes it special. So people who ate the most like the mind diet were found to have cognitive functioning equal to being 7.5 years younger, which is kind of cool, and found that the longer the person follows the mind diet plan, the lower the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And I have to say too, I just read something and it looks like um, they've been doing some studies with Parkinson's disease, and it looks like the mind diet can help with um, preventing that too, also especially in women. So it, um, just really interesting stuff. So what do you eat? Now you're wondering, right? So there's no foods that are outright eliminated no unusual foods, and there's something for everyone. So there's 10 brain healthy foods. There's the leafy greens, nuts, berries, beans, whole grains, fish, poultry, olive oil, and wine. So if you're like wine. <laughs> so five un like ones that you kind of want to have less of, right? So there are the red meats, fried and fast foods, butter and stick margin, cheese, and pastries and sweets. So we'll talk about these individually. So it's like we got these 10 foods to eat. And if so, if you kind of broke this down, then it would be green leafy vegetables, one salad daily, other vegetables, you would have like at least one other serving daily of some other vegetable, um, nuts, one serving daily, berries, two or more servings a week, blueberries and strawberries, they're preferred for the brain, beans, four, um, three, three to four servings per week, whole grains, three servings daily, fish, one or more servings per week, Poultry, we got at least two servings per week. It's kind of impressive, huh? Um, olive oil, this should be your primary oil and wine. They found that one glass a day can help. And then, so looking at the foods like to have less of then, the red meats, um, less than four servings a week. So really trying to have it less than four times at least can help. Butter and stick margarine, less than one tablespoon a day. Cheese, less than one serving a week. And, you know, I talked to her once, you know, about the cheese, because a lot of people are like, no, not the cheese, you know, don't take the cheese. So the idea is basically don't like smother things with cheese. It's more of um, kind of using cheese as a garnish and kind of like a Parmesan with a lot of flavor. Um, things like that could really help um, your brain just because cheese tends to have high saturated fat, like butter. So pastries and sweets, less than five servings a week and fried or fast foods, less than one serving per week but you get to eat all those other foods. <laughs> so the mind diet, like, what does that look like for your week then? So it includes at least three servings of whole grains, a salad and one other vegetable every day, along with a glass of wine. You could have nuts on most days, beans every other day or so, poultries and berries at least twice a week, and fish at least once a week. And then limit eating the designated unhealthy foods, um, especially butter less than one tablespoon a day, whole fat cheese and fried or fast food. So. Um, some people ask me too about fish. They're like, wouldn't you want to have that like every day? Um, just because we kind of know it has um, some really great things for the brain. And what they found is that people who just um, were having it zero, the people who had it one had like a huge jump in like the benefits to the brain. And then two, it was just uh, small. So they were saying, you know, at least one can make a difference. So let's get just a little bit more into the detail here. Uh, we have leafy green vegetables at least six servings a week so you're like uh oh, that's a lot on salad so it's almost like it's having one every day right so some sort of salad or you could um you know do you could roast the leaves and make kale chips or you could um puree it and put it in a sauce so there's different ways to have the salad greens but it would be one half cup 
um, cooked or one cup raw. And if there's one thing that you would be willing to change, like you're like, taste doesn't matter, whatever, whatever you want me to do. Um, I would say adding a salad could be a really, really good thing for your brain. So eating plenty of vegetables, like we know has been linked to slower rate of cognitive, cognitive decline in older adults, but leafy greens, like the kale, collard, beet greens, spinach, lettuce, toss that they seem to offer the greatest protection. So I have to tell you, this is kind of cool, but it's um, participants who ate one to two servings of green vegetables a day had a dramatic decrease in the rate of cognitive decline. So that was um, said by that Dr. Morris, and it was like the equivalent of being 11 years younger in age. So if you can um, find a way to incorporate some spinach into your life or some collard greens or something like that, um, trying different ways would be it's worth a shot. So then the other vegetables, so they want you to have at least one of the leafy and then at least one serving a day of something else, you know, whatever color you want, um, a half cup cooked or raw, at least. So that would be like, you know, the green beans or asparagus or carrots or sweet potato or red peppers, you know, just at least one other thing and trying to get different colors because the colors do something different for you. So um, berries, we got at least two servings a week. Blueberries and strawberries appear to be the most potent in terms of brain health. And it's kind of cool, you know, like um, someone asked me after the class, you know, they were like, what about bananas? And I was like, you know, they have nutrients that are good for the brain, but they found just the ones that really, really significantly help the brain part, you know, like the bananas are great for the heart and everything else. But um, like they found the blueberries actually can help with memory and the strawberries can help with motor function. So they're rich in polyphenols and they're so like they have phytochemicals that go in and fight off free radicals. Um, reducing inflammation then and removing toxic proteins that accumulate with age. So it's kind of cool what berries can do. So that's another one to add. Maybe you can throw them on the salad. <laughs> so talking about things to throw on the salad, then nuts would be another great one. At least five servings a week. So that's almost every day. So if you could um, start to like some nuts maybe with your salad, then you could just remember to get them all the time. So one serving is about one fourth cup. That's about your cupped handful. And so then, um, you know, all types, they help lower the bad cholesterol, and that's why we think it might help, and they can guard against type 2 diabetes, um, so they can be really great. And walnuts could be um, one of the all-stars, and they're um, pictured there, but it's just um, like research suggests eating more walnuts can improve your memory, concentration, and the speed at which your brain processes information. So they've done studies on that, the walnut people, um, and found that, so um, pretty cool. Okay, so um, legumes, at least four servings a week. So, you know, on top of your salad that you're having all the time with the nuts and the berries, maybe you could add on some beans too. Um, one, one serving would be one half cooked, one half cup cooked, or, you know, including them in chili or having them in place of some of the meat if you make like tacos or something like that. Um, but lentils and beans, like any of those kidney beans, pinto beans, black beans, chickpeas, it's just that they're carbohydrates um, that are really great at keeping blood sugar control. So it's like providing a steady stream of fuel like to the brain then. So, you know, like it also can help lower your blood, blood pressure and your cholesterol and the, you know, things that are good for your heart are also good for your brain. So take note, right? <laughs> so whole grains, at least three servings a day. One serving would be one slice of 100% whole grain bread, half cup of um, brown rice. You could have three cups of popcorn for a serving, quinoa, whole grain pasta, oatmeal, one cup of ready to eat breakfast cereal, that's whole grain, but they um, promote a healthy cardiovascular system. So like I said, what's good for your heart is good for your brain, which is good, you know, because you got to keep the blood going to your brain. And then this is help keep this is helping keep your arteries clear so that it's easy to do that. So, um, you know, the blood, the brain can get the flow that it needs and it can, if it doesn't, then it can bear, impair your memory and your thinking ability. So that's important. Fish, uh, we were talking about that before, just at least one serving a week. So one serving would be three ounces cooked. So it's a little bit bigger, like three ounces cooked of meat would be like the palm of your hand or a deck of cards. But three ounces of fish is more kind of like more like a, the size of a checkbook, unless it's a really thick fish. So oily fish such as salmon, trout, sardines, and herrings, herring, <laughs> herrings are in omega-3. They have omega-3 fatty acids, and they're really great for brain, brain function. And so I've done um, some digging, and I was asking, um, you know, well, what about fried fish? Because I was wondering if, you know, you could fry it and get the same benefits. 
And so it just, it's looking like um, that just people like when it's fried, a lot of the, the, the profile is changed some that the omega threes um, were destroyed in one of the studies and just that, um, yeah, that the profile changed in another one. So it's just um, like, if you can bake or steam or broil them, that would be the prime way to go unless they find conflicting studies later. So that's what I have for that one. Um, poultry, it's the chicken and, or turkey, um, three ounces cooked. So just think, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up. So that would be a great time to, you know, maybe you could have that turkey instead of um, maybe another red meat and because it's associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. And then olive oil just to use that as your primary cooking oil. It's olive oil, it's rich source of monounsaturated fat and it's the type that helps reduce inflammation and it prevents um, blood vessel dysfunction. So that's why it can be a really great one just um, thinking about your heart again too. And then wine, um, one serving a day. So one serving is about five ounces and studies suggest that one glass of wine can help um, preserve the memory and reduce Alzheimer's risk. So low levels of alcohol are thought to have anti-inflammatory effects on the brain, but too much, however, can damage the brain. So this is a time when there's definitely, um, you know, not going over the one glass a day would be great. And it didn't specify red or white, um, but you know, like there is like, um, it looks like there's an increased chance in breast cancer if you drink alcohol. So it's like, you know, you kind of something to balance, I guess, you know, it could be good for your brain, but it could increase your risk of cancer. So, um, you know, I'd say if you don't drink already, you know, if you're not drinking now, don't start. Um, and then just, you could also try getting some of those polyphenols from fruits and vegetables or like dark grapes. So that's another option. So limiting the brain on healthy foods then. So if you can just focus on the other ones, you know, you won't even have to worry about these just because you'll be eating the other ones and you know, you don't have time to think about them. So butter or stick margarine less than one tablespoon a day. So you're using like olive oil most of the time and fried or fast foods less than um, once a week. So, you know, most of the time you're just baking, broiling, steaming, um, grilling, microwaving, <laughs> just anything like that. And then red meat fewer than four times a week. So trying to have some of that fish or chicken or beans and then full fat cheese less than once a week and pastries and sweets less than five times a week. So some other notes then I just wanted to say um, coffee and cocoa, they have potential to be added in the future. But I think more research is needed. I haven't heard, um, I need to look into that and just see if there are some more, but it looks like they could potentially be added to the diet. And the study also found that people with diets high in trans fats, which are now outlawed, outlawed from our food supply, which is really good, um, we're more likely to have brain shrinkage and lower scores on thinking and memory tests. So that's really good. They got rid of that. So um, last, I just, you know, I haven't really talked about it very much, but just I wanted to, like, wanted to make sure to tell you that even though diet plays a big role, it looks like it's only one aspect of Alzheimer's disease. So like, um, you know, getting regular exercise and managing your stress can lower your risk even more. And they found that overall fitness level um, showed lower levels of shrinkage in the brain due to an exercise program, demonstrating that exercise can help maintain like the brain size. And I just think that's so cool. So it's like, you know, something, it doesn't cost anything luckily for us. And we can just um, move in some way that you enjoy moving and that can really help um, keep your brain healthy and strong. So um, like thinking then, uh, just looking back then how you could make the mind diet work for you. So just, you know, maybe on breakfast, you know, maybe sometimes you really try to choose berries um, to have with your cereal or with your oatmeal and your oatmeal would be a whole grain. So you'd be getting some there and then maybe picking leafy greens when you can. You can either toss that on, say you get a pizza, you could toss like a handful on it when it comes out of the oven. Um, and drizzle some balsamic vinegar on it or something, but at least it's a way to get some of those greens, right? Um, there's a waffle pictured on the right there and that if you can look really closely, it has okra on it. So maybe you can sneak your vegetables into some foods that you love um, or just include them in snacks. So that is what I have for you today. So I just have um, reminding you of the short evaluation and then this is me and I will turn it over to Eileen, I think. And maybe we can just look at the questions when we get done. Eileen, does that sound okay? 
Sure. Um, all right, I need to share my screen. Yeah, if you can, um, I think I made you co-host, so it should work. Okay. All right, let's see. Screen two. Am I still there? Yep, you got it. I see your slides. Okay, why don't I? That's weird. Maybe. So you do? I do. I see the slide deck, all of them. Okay, let me. Um... All right, so you see that one? The first yeah. slide? You, you guys want to write in the chat? Do you guys see it okay? Um, it's just not in presenter view. It's pretty small, but. Oh, okay. Let me put it in presenter view. Give me a second here. It's not. Is that better? Yes. How's that bigger? Okay. Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. I would have to say, Andrea, you are extremely persistent. So <laughs> this this was meant to happen. So I um, I'm glad to be able to join you and helping people understand that there are things you can do to reduce risk. And I definitely uh, want to say that everyone at the Institute, our doctors all strongly advocate the mind diet. So the information that you presented is exactly what we tell people. Um, it's sad to say that the majority of children today eat uh, chicken nuggets and french fries and everything you were describing was such a wonderfully colorful non-fried diet and look what we give our kids so that's not that's not good so what are some other things i want to continue along the line of what andre was talking about um, about um, ways to reduce risk so i want to talk i'm not going to obviously get into diet since i think that was a, a great overview of the mind diet I want to talk about some other things, including comorbidities, which are other diseases that you're dealing with. Everyone has more than one health issue. Physical activity, cognitive activity, sleep, physical and mental health, and safety. So I want to talk about, um, again, I'm not going to get into the MIND diet other than to say we do highly recommend that you look into that. And I know I saw in the chat some people don't eat this, they don't eat blueberries, you know, eat other berries. You know, I think if you can do as many of those things that were positive and the things that she mentioned to eliminate, the more you can do, the greater you're reducing your risk. You know, we know due to allergies or preferences, you may not be able to do all of them, but, you know, eating fast food and frying foods and eating a, veg a, a, a diet with no vegetables or fruit is surely not the answer. So the next thing is comorbidities. We know that there are other diseases that people have. And as you get older, you know, you are going to have some other health issues. And we look at, we don't want you to look at those as separate issues that you've got these health issues and you're also worried about your memory. They really, a lot of health issues definitely over, um, re react, overact, um, relate to your um brain health. So you need to really look at them together. Specifically diabetes, we know that diabetes um, definitely increases your risk of getting dementia. So if you have some of these other health issues, you can't necessarily get rid of them, no, but you have to really be very good about maintaining and monitoring them. So diabetes, depression, and heart disease are three big ones that you really want to focus on making sure if you have any problems that you go to your doctor and you manage these, not only to manage them for, them, for those diseases, but to manage them well to reduce your risk for any type of dementia. You also want to manage other health issues, which would include high blood pressure and high cholesterol because these will increase your risk of both Alzheimer's disease as well as vascular dementia. The next ones I wanna talk about is physical activity. And I know Andrea mentioned this briefly, but physical activity is critical. We know that it's good for the brain, getting that blood flow and getting oxygen to the brain is extremely important. If you have physical limitations and you can't go to a gym, now obviously with the pandemic, a lot of people aren't, or even if you can't do a lot of walking, I mean, you can sit in a chair 
and still exercise. If you don't have the finances to go out and buy all these fancy gizmos and, uh, and activities, you can sit in a chair and just sit and hold a pound bag of sugar or a canned vegetable, you know, whatever it might be, and just exercise. With so much on online now, you can go to, um, I think, AARP, even the public libraries. You can go online and they have free zoom exercise classes so there's so many things that you can do to get some exercise no matter what your physical ability is um, if you have a lot of arthritis obviously swimming is a good one but there's always exercise that you can do and whatever you can do is still going to help your help brain health um, we now know that the whole phrase use it or lose it couldn't be more true. Cognitive activity is really important. And people tell me, oh, well, I do the morning crossword puzzle. Doing the morning crossword puzzle leisurely while you sip your coffee is not really enough. What we say, it's almost like going to the gym and sit there and you're going to do curls with one hand. It's obviously not going to help your whole body. The same thing is true with doing cognitive activities. What you're trying to do is you're trying to get all of the brain cells that you have, you're trying to stimulate more brain cell connection. And by doing all different types of cognitive activity, you actually can create more cell connection and you can actually create a reserve, which can either help to, if you do end up getting any type of dementia, give you cognitive reserve, or it can also delay on site because you have created a stronger, more functioning brain. So what are the things that you wanna do? The key is to stimulate all areas of the brain. So just doing crossword puzzles is only dealing with vocabulary. You wanna make sure you do puzzles that stimulate numbers, do Sudoku puzzles. People say, well, I don't like that. That's all, they're actually not a number puzzle. They're actually a logic puzzle. It has nothing to do with numbers but they're logic puzzles. Incorporate um, puzzles that might be, you know, uh, um, jigsaw puzzles. Incorporate art. Even if you're not good at art, it doesn't matter. Create, they make wonderful adult coloring books. I've been doing it. It's a great stress reliever. They're more adult pictures, not kid pictures, and they're beautiful. It doesn't matter if you're good or bad. Do some um, painting, do some, any kind of art. Buy Play-Doh and sit and play with it. It stimulates a different area of the brain. Research has also shown that listening to music, learning music, playing music is extremely beneficial to brain health. So I would encourage music as part of your daily routine. Puzzles, as long as you do a variety are very good. Reading, listening to documentaries, whatever it is, but you wanna do a nice variety. Um, you want to stay socially active and engaged. I know during this pandemic, we've seen a lot of people who've lost a lot of social activity um, and engagement. And we've also seen an increase of people who have dementia progressing because of that lack of activity. Um, if you want to play different games, a lot of games that you can play on the computer all say, oh, this game will do this for your brain. This game will do this for the brain. The one that we've done extensive research on at USF is on the program called Brain HQ. I should have put that actually on the screen, but if you want to take that down, Brain HQ is a good program. It's got games that monitor your level so they keep staying a little bit um, challenging for you. They have games that focus on processing speed, which is what you need to keep thinking. Um, processing speed is how well your brain can process all the information that comes in. People with dementia, their processing speed gradually slows down. So if you want to do good games, even if you don't do Brain HQ, there's luminosity, or if you do a crossword puzzle, time yourself doing things to make you have to pick up your speed. Divided attention are games that have different areas on the game board that you have to focus on. Sometimes there may be two or three things to multitask. Sometimes there could be three or four things and you've got to try not to look at these and focus on one. So it's creating this need to divide your attention on different areas. So those are very good games and cognitive activities to do. Um, watching TV, 
is not considered a cognitive activity. Unless you're with a group, maybe you're watching a documentary, maybe you're watching an educational video, and then you're discussing it. But just merely watching TV and some of the mindless TV is actually not a, co a, a good cognitive activity. Um, there's a high correlation between sleep and brain health. You need sleep for your brain to relax, to clean itself, to process the memories that you've made. So sleep is really very important. Um, so therefore lack of sleep due to sleep apnea, due to stress, due to pain, whatever your reason that you're not sleeping well, um, that can definitely affect memory. Some other ones, physical health. You wanna maintain overall good physical health, monitoring your weight. Again, we mentioned cholesterol, blood pressure. You wanna know your numbers and really monitor your overall physical health. Mental health, that is extremely important. And I would say we have seen such an increase of people contacting the Institute for Screenings. Um, because they've been having due to the pandemic and all the issues with, you know, watching the news all the time and staying home more during this past year, we have seen a much higher incidence of loneliness, of stress, anxiety, depression, and all of these can greatly affect your concentration and can affect your overall memory and brain health. So you really want to manage your mental health as much as you can and do things, you know, to do, you know, support groups, talking to friends, doing things to help maintain your mental health. We say limiting the news because the news is so negative, especially this past year, you know, you could sit home and watch the news all day, but it's so negative that it really increases levels of anxiety and depression. The last one is safety, wearing seatbelts and helmets. We um, now know that head injury, like football players, boxers have a much higher rate of Alzheimer's due to concussions and head injury. So those are some of the main areas that we talk about. We all know and have heard over the years things that are good for your heart. Well, now we know that everything you've learned that is good for your heart is good for your brain. So again, that cholesterol and blood pressure keep coming up, managing your weight, not smoking. You know, smoking limits the, the blood flow to the brain, um, also affects the heart, puts you at a higher risk of vascular dementia. Um, Andrea also already talked greatly about, you know, eating healthy, exercise. So all of these things that are good for the heart, we now know are equally or more so good for the brain. So there are other things that didn't fall in these categories that I do want to mention. These are other issues that can actually affect your memory. One is medication. Um, there's so many medications out there that if you read the fine print that's real small, a lot of them will say affects you know, memory affects concentration. I mean, people who say, oh, I have trouble sleeping. So I thought I'd go to the store and I bought myself some Tylenol PM. That PM is actually gonna affect your memory. That's all that is, is Benadryl. And any of those over-the-counter meds with Benadryl will affect your memory. People take certain medications for, um, you know, various diseases and there are some that will affect memory. So make sure before you get any new medication, talk to the doctor, talk to the pharmacist, making sure that what you're taking and you could be combining meds that you don't realize could have an effect or taking too many meds. So always be aware of the medications, not just prescription meds, but over-the-counter meds because there are over-the-counter meds that can affect concentration and memory. Um, obviously, I'm not going to get into diet because you heard of what a good diet is and the things to avoid. So um, you want to really focus on improving your diet as much as you can. We don't think of dehydration, but living in Florida, you really want to be aware of dehydration because dehydration can cause memory problems. Um, so you want to make sure that you drink enough fluid, um, not soda and coffee are caffeinated, but drinking herbal tea, drinking water, many of the foods that Andrea mentioned are high in water content. Obviously watermelon, some of your vegetables, a lot of fruit. So looking for those kind of foods that are high in water content 
um, also are good for dehydration. Stress and anxiety, I mentioned, sleep apnea and lack of sleep. Um, both of these um, deprive your brain of oxygen. Um, so you really, if you do have sleep apnea, we know that a lot of people don't like wearing the mask, but we do notice it makes a huge difference. Another is hearing loss. Hearing loss doesn't necessarily cause a memory problem. It's often misdiagnosed or people don't realize because someone with a hearing loss may not be engaging in conversation. They may not, you may think they're not remembering things, but maybe they're just not hearing things. They may be more withdrawn. So hearing loss sometimes will cause symptoms that will appear to be a memory problem. Often chronic pain, you know, if you're in chronic pain, you're not sleeping as well, you're not focusing or concentrating as well, you may be taking some strong pain medications. So people who do have chronic pain oftentimes complain about memory. Um, again, with some of those um, prescription strength, strong pain medications, you need to talk to the doctor because there are many that can affect concentration and again, memory. Other medical conditions, diabetes, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, um, cancer treatment, anesthesia from any, any type of surgery, um, those can also affect your memory. If you have a low vitamin B12 level, that can affect memory. B12 is, is um, metabolized in a very specific area. So sometimes people say, well, I know I take a B12 pill. Taking the pill, you want to still make sure your body is metabolizing it and that your B12 level is in a good range. If you have a um, poorly active thyroid, that can also affect memory, but with proper medication and management, that can also be um, monitored and, and keeping it at a good level so it doesn't affect your memory. And the other thing that we see quite often, and especially in older adults, is infections can affect memory. The most common one is urinary tract infections. Um, you may see somebody who's all of a sudden doing pretty good, and then all of a sudden you see this major change, and oftentimes it's due to a urinary tract infection, that those types of acute infections can def definitely will cause a memory problem. And if someone already has a memory problem, this will greatly um, increase that, that confusion. So always be aware of that. So there's obviously a lot of things that you need to look at and to monitor that can definitely help. You know, if you're gonna take medic, um, vitamins, I mentioned the vitamin B12, talk to the doctor, talk to the pharmacist. You know, some of the vitamins are, you know, you don't wanna take them in mega doses. Some your body can store, some your body cannot. So you're spending a lot of money for medications that, you know, are excreted in, in your, your pee every day. I hate to be blunt, but, um, and also some of the over-the-counter um, supplements, you know, right now we have not had any proof that some of those over-the-counter supplements um, are reducing risk. So always talk to the pharmacist before you buy some of these over-the-counter meds, um, thinking, well, you know, they don't need a prescription, so they're, they're easy to get, but they still, you still need to get some um, medical advice before taking some of those. And you don't want to overwhelm your body with vitamins if you have a very healthy diet. So um, those are some of the things to consider. I think that gives you a lot of, a lot of things that you can do to help reduce your risk. People always say, well, what if my family had it? Should I look at genetics? We always say is you can't change genetics. So we like to focus on the things that you can change. If you had a parent who had Alzheimer's before the age of 65, your risk is going to be slightly increased. That's early onset, which increases your risk. You also, but if your parent was over 65, your, your increased risk is very minor because they're, they probably got it because of, you know, age and not, they got late onset, not early onset. Um, the other thing is you do get a gene from both parents, the APOE gene. 
Um, you can get APOE4, which is one of the variations that increases risk. But again, these types of things don't guarantee you're going to get it, but they're risk factors that are there. You can't change them. You can merely worry about them, but we don't suggest doing genetic testing. We suggest listening to all this information on all the different things you can do to reduce your risk. You know, genetics is an area that you cannot change. All of these others are things that you have the ability to change and make a difference. So that's where we would rather you focus your attention. So that's all I have on reducing risk for it. The one other thing I wanted to talk about that we, I think was included on, on the description of the program is a lot of people don't know when to worry. Understanding that difference between normal age-related memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. You know, people say to me, oh, I'm so worried, I can't find my keys. My first question is, could you find your keys in your 30s or were you always losing them in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s? If that's the case, you're consistent. So don't call us because now you're losing your keys and you're 65. So the first thing is we always look to see, is this a difference? from your norm. So now I can't see everybody, but I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to be perfectly honest to yourself with the answer. So the first one, I have three questions to ask you. The first question, have you ever been in one room of your house, needed something in another room, got to the doorway and you had no idea what you came in there for and you just are standing there going, what did I come here for? Most people will raise their hand. Second question, have you ever been out and let's say you're walking through Publix or Walmart and you see somebody, you recognize that you know them, but you cannot come up with their name or where you know them from and it drives you crazy. Third question, have you ever been in an event, you go to a luncheon or a friend's uh, barbecue, a church group, whatever it might be, and someone comes up to you and has say, hey, I brought my friend along, they introduce you, two minutes later, that guest comes up to you, and that fast, you cannot come up with their name. Again, no matter what age group I ask, everybody can identify with these. So are these normal, or are these a problem? So the big difference is the ones I just talked about, you forget why you came into a room. The key is, let's say you're sitting at your table in your kitchen and you're addressing a birthday card. And you say, oh, the stamps are in my wallet. My wallet is on my dresser in my bedroom. You get up and as you're walking to the bedroom, you are thinking about all the things you got to do today. Oh, I got to take this back. And oh yeah, I got to pick up my prescription. Oh yeah, I'm going to, I have to RSVP for that event. By the time you get to the bedroom door, you look around and go, what did I come in here for? because our mind is just so busy and preoccupied and we're always thinking. But what you do at that point is critical. Usually you say, my goodness, what in the world did I come in here for? What was I just doing? I know it had something to do with that. And you will walk back to the table, see that card with the addressed envelope and go, oh, that's right. I came in here for that stamp. Then you go in and you're determined and you get the stamp. The second one, <clears throat> You see someone walking down the aisle of Publix, you look at them, they wave, they say hello, you sit and you chat. You don't remember their name. You're driving yourself crazy. You can't think of it. You're walking, you say goodbye and had a lovely chat. The rest of the time you're shopping, you still can't come up with their name. And then you wake, you, you go home later that night and you're still thinking who in the, who was that person? You may wake up the next morning and you still can't remember it. The next week you go back to the, doc, the dentist for your follow-up appointment and you walk in and you see the hygienist that always helps you and you go, oh my God, that's who I saw last week in Publix. That's normal. You saw her, always see her in one place, sitting in a chair, looking up at her face, you know, with a mask. And now you saw her in public, so you just didn't recognize how you knew her. That's normal. What would be the response with somebody with a memory problem or Alzheimer's by time they left Publix, 
they would have forgotten that they ever ran into somebody. So even if you don't remember or don't run into them again, the fact that you can still say days later, yeah, I was talking to someone in Publix for the life of me, I still can't remember who it is, but you still remember that you saw somebody, a person with a true memory problem, that whole incident would have just been completely a non-issue because they would have forgotten it by the time they got home. The one on being introduced to someone and moments later, you don't recall their name. You go to a party and someone says, oh, I wanna tell you, here's my friend, Eileen. I thought I'd bring her you know, and let her meet all my friends. You say, oh, hi, Eileen, and you walk away. <clears throat> And then a few minutes later, she comes up to you and you're looking at yourself going, I cannot believe I cannot remember her name. I was just introduced. What happens is we tend to blame our memory on a lot of things when memory is two parts. The first part is saving information. If you don't save information, the second part is recalling. If you didn't do anything to save it, you can't blame your brain for not recalling it. That's like saying you studied zero for that test and you failed because you didn't study. You didn't try and put it into your brain. If I said to you, here's a treasure chest, open it, take out what you like and you open it and there's nothing there. I can't tell you to take out something if I didn't put something in. So when you're introduced to someone and they say, oh, I'd like you to meet my friend, Eileen. Oh, hi, Eileen, it's so nice to meet you. How do you spell your name? E-I-L-E-E-N or do you spell it with an I? I know someone with that name. Say the name, repeat it. When they leave, think it. You know, If you're not gonna do something to try and save information, then yes, you're not gonna remember it later. With Alzheimer's disease, you know, they will not remember some things later because they truly have a short-term memory. Also, I could say, you know, hey, Andrew, remember we went out to lunch and we were on the, that restaurant, we were overlooking that, that lake and it was just that beautiful view that we both liked and we saw those people out there doing that dance. I could jog your memory. With someone with Alzheimer's disease, if they no longer have short-term memory, nothing is going to jog their memory because they don't have that ability to save new things. They can see it in the moment, they will enjoy it, but when they try and save it, the part of their brain that can save that new memory doesn't work. So really what you need to do as you get older, especially, is take the effort and the time to do more to save things, and that will help you to recall them. Um, some other things, misplacing objects, you'll remember later. You may say, gee, where's my phone? I can't find it. And then you say, okay, where was the last time I used my phone? Oh, that's right. I was sitting in the office. I was on the computer and I was looking something up while I was doing something else on the screen. You go retrace your steps and you can find things. You know, so you may remember later, but you also have cognitive ability to retrace your steps and find things. Person with Alzheimer's, if they can't find it, they don't have the ability to logically think where they may have left it. They may not be able to retrace their steps anymore. They may put things in odd places. You may say to me, yeah, I lost my phone last week and I still can't find it. So you can't find it. So yes, you may be upset that you can't find it, but the fact that you remember a week later that you lost it, where I could say to someone with Alzheimer's, hey, I heard you lost your phone, did you find it? They may look at you and say, oh, I lost my phone, when did I lose my phone? You know, so those are some of the differences. You may have trouble balancing a checkbook, may take you a little longer, where somebody with Alzheimer's may no longer be able to do those types of cognitive skills. You may forget something every now and then. You may get a call on the phone. Oh, this is you know the, the Polk County Library. Uh, you have some books overdue. Please return them at your earliest convenience. And you say, oh my goodness, I knew those books were due. I even took them out. Where someone with Alzheimer's might get that same recording and say, I don't have any books. I don't know what they're talking about because they completely forgot the entire situation. 
So those are some of the differences. The big thing we look for when you're starting to experience memory issues is we look to see if it's affecting your daily life. Obviously, um, people lose words, you know, you, oh, I can't come up with that word, it's on the tip of my tongue. If that happens on an occasional basis, that's fine. If you're noticing it's happening throughout the day in many, many conversations, then it's something to be concerned more about. We look for a change. If you were an accountant and math was your skill set for all your career, and now you can't add or subtract or do math, that's a change in your strength. If you were an avid reader and your vocabulary was great and you're noticing that you are constantly having trouble coming up with words and coming up with the names of things, that's a change. If you had a great um, sense of direction and now you're constantly getting lost. So those are some things. The other thing to keep in mind is you will notice some changes in your memory and some changes you will not notice. So you're gonna to need to rely on a close family member or friend to say, you know, I'm really getting concerned. I'm noticing some changes that you may need to go talk to your doctor. You may not notice that you're um, saying the same thing over and over again, asking the same question over and over again. Maybe some of your judgment or decisions are not logically as good as they used to be. So some things, personality changes, some things you will notice, some things you will not notice. Tell somebody that you trust that, hey, if you see some of these things as upsetting as it will be, let me know because the sooner you go for an evaluation, the better. One, it could be something else. And two, the sooner you get any type of treatment or the medication that is available, to slow things down, the better. So you don't want to wait. So those are just a good, some of the common things that people always look for or come in and that they're concerned about. Um, so just wanted to give you some other information just quickly about the Bird Institute before we have a little time for questions. Um, we do a lot of clinical drug studies. Um, many of them are for people who don't have any problems that are looking to participate in studies for prevention. So if you're interested in, in a study for prevention, some studies may not even involve medication. They may be monitoring people over a period of time. So at any point, we have many studies going on. If you're interested, you can either go on our website or you can give Anna a call and say you're interested in seeing what studies that we have. Um, I'll put our website up in a minute and it does list current studies that we're doing, but at any point, we're always getting new ones. If you know somebody who already is having some very mild memory problems, they're not quite where they used to be and they're getting a little bit concerned, we have an occupational therapy department at the Institute and she works with people to do cognitive skills development. This is covered by insurance for people who have some type of mild memory issues. Doesn't mean you have to have Alzheimer's, just that you're concerned about your, you know, you have some memory issue, not just concerned, that she can work with you that actually can help improve um, some memory and some cognitive skills. So that's definitely a resource that you might want to keep in mind. The other thing that we do, I know this isn't regarding um, brain health, but just so you're aware, because now you talk to people, everybody knows caregivers. In addition to doing a lot of talks on brain health, I also do all of our caregiver education and support. This is the website for our caregiver section. Um, we have all of our programs are on Zoom, so it doesn't matter where anybody lives. We have people from all over the country now coming onto our workshops. Our support group is online, is on Zoom. Our workshops are on Zoom. For people who work and maybe just want information at their own time, we have a very good caregiver podcast, which are just something to listen to. They're 30 minutes. All of these can be accessed on our caregiver page of our website. 
Um, here is our main website here. You can go to our, our caregivers information. You can even look up, see what research we're doing, our clinical research. We also have um, a driving specialist. And we also have our clinic where we see patients that come in for evaluation. Um, you can take any one of these resources. You don't have to be a patient in our clinic to take advantage of our other resources. So that's just good, a good overview of what we do. So I have my email, my phone number. Um, Andrea can always reach out to me if you lose this and get in touch with me if you have any other questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea and we will take any questions from people. If you guys have any questions and you wanna put them in the chat, that'd be great. Um, I it was looking back and I saw, um, Denise, that's really awesome about your spinach and arugula. She said she puts it on a sandwich. Um, and then Jackie mentioned that there are non-alcoholic wines on the market with less than 0.5% alcohol. And Denise asks, um, how does the mind diet, um, she asks, how does the mind diet, let's see, lost the question, help with depression? Um, and I just, you know, I did some Googling while um, Eileen was talking just to, I guess, look into that more. And it looks like there's been at least one study that found that, you know, it was, you know, still helped the mind, but that it wasn't um, beneficial so much for depression. I'm guessing some of the foods probably definitely are. Um, they also looked at the Mediterranean diet and that one was so helpful for depression. So if you, you know, like maybe combining the two and just remembering the mind diet food specifically can really help. Um, let me see if there's anything else. You know, I was going to ask Eileen, you know, in that, um, in, what Lori does with the uh, cognitive skills. Is that kind yes. of like what you were telling us like to do with like the puzzles and the Well, things she, like that? she does, it's more computer-based. So you still have to be able to, it's different games and just how to use games correctly, what types of games and what kind of cognitive skills. So it's more, I think it focuses more on that, not just telling you, she actually shows you ones to do, works with you on doing them and then how to develop a program to then continue at home. Okay, thanks, I was curious. I would love to take that just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's all I have. And then, okay, like I guess email us if you have any questions, you guys. And Eileen, I really appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Bye, you guys. Have a good day.